Hey YouTube, it's JP Dillon. I'd like to preface this video uh, by saying a couple things. Number one, uh, there were two separate videos made. One uh, was the original, and the other one was specifically for the right deck because I had believed that the left uh, deck footage had been corrupted. I managed to recover it, and I pasted the two repairs together. Uh, this was a nightmare machine. It's kind of sort of working, but not great. And so uh, I'm just going to say you can't fix them all. I got this one so that it plays, which you'll see in the upcoming videos was just really scary. Just about every imaginable thing wrong with one of these showed up. And so uh, without further ado, I'll let you guys watch the video and you can see what a scary nightmare this machine was. They aren't all like this. This was an exception. Uh, but really just crazy amounts of work went into this so that it could run just run it's still not perfect but it runs so yeah check it out hey YouTube it's JP Dillon today we're gonna look at a very popular uh, cassette mechanism that Sony created sometime in the 1990s and the mechanism is known as the TCM 190 TCM 190 uh, this was in a variety of cassette decks, uh, and they usually had the prefix TCWR, uh, like the TCWR 510, 521, uh, 570, uh, 590, etc. Uh, gosh, there's probably others too, like the TCWE 635. Anyway, we're going to go through the aspects of removing the transports and uh, servicing them from belts to the primary mode of failure these days which has to do with the plastic gear. So let me get this one apart and I'll show you uh, uh, how to identify whether it's a TCM 190 or not and uh, how to get it apart and service it. So looking inside this is typically what you're going to see. Now there are two different variants of the TCM 190. Let me bust this loose from the mount here and I'll show you. This is the full featured version of the TCM 190. It's got two boards stacked here. Uh, this is your playback and record board uh, and this is your control board and it's on both decks. So both decks are capable of playback and recording. Later in simplified generations just had one board going to the rear uh, which makes disassembly a little bit easier. But in either case, the first thing that you have to do in order to get these out is to remove the front panel. And so typically what you do is on the 800 series, we're working on a WR820 today, uh, it's going to have these logic cables. All the TCM190s have the logic cables that go to the front. Uh, you've also got power and signal going to the playback amplifiers, which just unplug here and here. Uh, <clears throat> you've got another cable to the motor board which goes here and the other one which goes here this is again on the 820 it will differ on different models and the reason why I'm disconnecting them at the board here is because it's easier than disconnecting it after you take it apart uh, these are signal cables I believe for the uh, playback chip and then you've got cables that go to and from the front panel. This is your audio output. Uh, this is a control for, I believe, the speed of the motor. And you just kind of want to go over to the front panel and see anything else that may be attached there. Most of the common ones that you see, like the TCR, the TCWR 521, etc., just have one big flat ribbon cable that carries everything to the front. Whereas this is a little more sophisticated, here's another front panel cable, and here's another front panel cable. Anyways, you may wish to mark where they go with Sharpies. I've worked on a lot of these, so I kind of have them all on memory. Uh, so once you get the front panel disconnected, then we can remove the front panel. And some of these will differ. There's usually arrows that denote what screws come out, like that there. That's an arrow that says, take me out. And so, it's kind of hard to do this one-handed, but we're going to take all these screws out. 
and we're going to get the front panel loose. There are front panel screws and there are transport screws. And on the case of the 820, there are screws that hold that little subboard in on the bottom. In some models, you will have to remove a foot or two in order to get to these screws, but this one I don't think so. I think this one just comes out. So we've got three front panel screws. The recessed ones in here are holding the transports in. Oh, these use a smaller screwdriver. I think these use an odd or a double lot. Anyway, i got to put this down for a second, or we'll just put it in the mount. This makes it a little easier to take it apart. It may be that this is the one that has the screws underneath. We'll find out in a moment, won't we? And then there's also a couple of screws that hold these front panel subboards in. Basically everything along the front side of the transport or front side of the frame needs to come out. So that brings everything out. And I'm just gonna separate this. Put it down over here. And there's our our front panel complete with our transports and everything. Uh, so we're good there. Now, uh, next thing you need to do, this is kind of a pain on these, depending on what's wrong. I think I'm going to take this off the mount again and show you. All right, one thing you have to do to get these transports out is you have to uh, take the door cover off. Now you can see this one ejected really easy. But what about the one that's jammed that doesn't eject? For God's sakes, don't pry the door open if it's stuck. Don't do that. I get so many of these things in where people grab the butter knife and they go nuts with it and they break something inside of the transport. If this is stuck in a cycle and you try to force the door open, you'll destroy the head block and the pinch rollers. You will render this a useless transport. So don't do that. Now, looking at the transport from the side, you can see there, there's this little plastic slide here with a little tab on it. What you want to do is cycle it manually, and you can push on it until you feel it trigger. Okay, and then what you got to do is rotate the flywheel clockwise. Now, this is going to take you a while. But basically what you do is, is you keep rotating the, uh, you keep rotating that flywheel clockwise until the cycling cam inside stops moving. Now I'm going to zoom in on the cycling cam so you can see it as I rotate the flywheel. See how it's moving? So, your purpose here is to get this into a reset position. And it's going to take you a couple of tries of pressing on this tab here and watching this cam until it stops rotating. Each time it stops rotating, you press the eject button until the door pops open. So, because of the length of time this is going to take, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, cut to where I'm able to get this open. Okay, so it took three total rotations, or three total attempts, to get the uh, cam to reset. But now I can pull that off. Again, don't try to force it. If you force it, you're going to kill it. Uh, on the 820, these are a little bit trickier to get out. They're not as easy. Uh, there's a couple ways you can do it. First, you do have to remove these two top screws here in order to get this loose and then we can uh, pop one of these out and I can show you what's up with it. So again with the smaller screwdriver I think this is a, an odd or a double odd. I don't remember. 
Let's see if it says on here. Yeah, the writing's wore off. Can't tell. But anyway, difference is regular one, this one, smaller of the two. I'm just my words aren't working today. I get to look at my hairy arm while I uh, take that out. And then once it's loose, there's still a screw on the bottom. Yep. Okay, once you got it loose, you should be able to work this out and around. Got to fidget with pressing on the front of the door to work it around here. I'm just going to do one transport at a time and make it easy on everybody. Okay. Now, the next part um, is basically disconnecting a bunch of stuff. First thing you have here, this is a detect switch, which is not on all of the transports, just happens to be on this one. So we're going to take this out, unroute it from its little clip here, let it dangle. This is your head wire assembly. Very carefully take these out. These wires are fragile. In fact, I'm going to pry on it just a little bit kind of get it loose this part's never fun and again you want to unroute it from its little holster here you don't want to tear any of these wires that would be bad news okay and the next thing we're gonna do there's three screws one is underneath this board so you will need to take this board up on a WR820 differences here are kind of a lot so maybe I'll do another one like on a 570 or something just so you can see the difference I'm just gonna pinch this and pinch this clip this is your HX Pro board apparently I knew it had something to do with the recording playback and once you get them loose there's a socket here pull up and remove the third screw is here in the center, that guy right there. Uh, sometimes the plastic swaging on this is broken and this will just turn incessantly. If that's the case, don't worry about it. That'll just make it easier to get out. Oh yeah, this one's already fairly trashed. It's just going to turn and turn and turn. Oh, there we go. That's going to come out. and then screw up here above the motor housing and screw up here above the other motor housing and then you want to unplug the real motor actually I don't think you have to I think it's all one one thing on this design and the way that you take this off is you tilt like this as you pull away and there we go we're going to separate the two halves and I'm going to show you the dominant failure mode that occurs on these decks uh, before we go any further let's give our motor a spin and listen to it it's nice and quiet there's no chatter so a little bit of oil on this bearing will make this fine somebody has already replaced the belts uh, but I can tell by looking at them they're too thick. Uh, they're narrow, but they're too thick, and the elasticity is not very good. Uh, this is a 2.9 inch, should be a 2.6. Anyway, let me get this off the uh, stand, and I'll show you what the dominant failure mode is. Okay, so the dominant failure mode on the TCM190 transport has to do with this gear assembly here and these things just die. The plastic gets old and brittle and shrinks slightly and if we zoom in you can see it develops a crack. 
See if I can get the camera to focus. See that nice crack there? Let's, uh, there we go. It's hard to hold this still at the zoom, but there's a crack there. You can see it. Uh, this crack does two things. Number one, it causes the gear to slip and it doesn't properly cycle. But more importantly, uh, under load, it will bind. When it runs over the crack, it will bind. In fact, it's doing that right now as I try to turn the planetary that goes around it. It will bind and it will cause the machine to try to eat your tape. Uh, so if it's got a crack in it, it's got to go. Again, if we zoom in here, you can see it's pretty obvious. Poor little crack there is, uh, yeah. Anyways, there is a dude who manufactured these brand new injection molded, and he's based in the Ukraine. Uh, he has an eBay store called the Silicone Mind. Let me get his, uh, his gears here. So when you get the gears, they come in a little soda cap bottle, compressed there, but here they are. These are brand spanking new. Very high quality injection molded. And they're an excellent replacement. And so really, all you need to do, this will come off really easy since it's got a crack and it just pinch and pull. The old gear comes off and just slide the new one on and it's going to be a tighter fit because new gear make sure that it's meshed correctly before you push it on there too much nice tight fit that's exactly what I want so uh, primarily the symptoms you'll get with the cracked gear are it doesn't cycle You'll hear a click and the motor will spin and that will be it. If it does manage to grip enough to cycle the machine, you may notice that the real table stops moving. It will try to eat your tape. Uh, also, a classic symptom of this gear beginning to die is that when you go from play to stop, the supply reel, which is weird, but this happens, the supply reel will unwind the tape. The supply reel will turn it counterclockwise really fast and unwind your tape in the cartridge. Bad news. So you want to change these gears out, and trust me, they're all going to die, just do it. Uh, it's not cheap to get a set of gears. Uh, I forget how much these were, they are almost $30, uh, including shipping. But, it makes the set work. Uh, in addition, you'll get gummy belt goo, and someone's already tried to clean it off here, maybe we'll clean this up a little bit more. Um, those flywheel bearings are good. If they're sticky, you just pull these out, oil them, put them back. The retainer usually falls out when you pull them. Other than that, uh, these are fairly straightforward. Another thing that you can do, which I recommend depending on it, whether your deck has lived near the beach or not, is ohm out these detect switches. See these detect switches up top here? Uh, you know, your record your tape detection, your tape type, make sure that these ohm out when you press on them. If they don't, uh, you need to pull the covers off and you need to burnish them. Now, it's not often that I see these fail, so I'm not really going to address it because it's maybe one out of a hundred decks I've seen where these switches go bad. And if you disassemble them, you'll find that there are two nipples on each side of the switch and you pry the plastic up very gently underneath them uh, to get the covers off. And if you're curious how to get this board out, there are two clips. There's one here, which you can undo, and there's another one here, which you can undo. And this entire board, with the switches on it, just lifts out like this. So, it's easy to get to. And you can see there, the little black things, those are the nipples that hold the covers on. Just pry up gently underneath the plastic and don't break them off, otherwise you'll never get the covers back on. But, these rarely ever die and it should be possible to just neglect that uh, if you need to clean them you can but they rarely ever die so one thing I'm going to do now that I've got this out and away is I'm going to get an oil or syringe and I'm going to put a drop of oil excuse me just need to get this set up a little bit better
gonna make everyone dizzy today. Put a drop of oil on the capstan bearing shaft there. And then work it in there. Uh, if you need to pull these out, you just pull up on them like this. They come out. Makes it easier to clean them too. These ones are already clean. But I'm just going to put a drop of oil right here on this bearing. Come back here and put this back. The retainer which almost always falls out, which is where to go. There it is. Come on, eject for me so I can put you back on. There we go. We're just going to slide that back on there. That just keeps things from moving. In fact, what we can do is just pull that out slightly and oil the bearing from this side and push it back in and push the retainer back on. You don't have to pull it all the way out, but it helps. Okay. So. That takes care of the dirty bits with the gear. Now what you have to do is clean the pinch rollers. Now on these, the pinch rollers, if we zoom in a little bit, I'm going to turn off my overhead lamp and use the flashlight on the camera. You can see that there's these clips here and you just apply a little bit of pressure. It's probably gonna be a two-handed job, so if I have to put the camera down, I have to put the camera down. And it did today. Yep, it's going to be a two-hand job, but you pull this clip back and you pull the pinch roller off And then we need a closer examine it for defect So this is about what you'd expect from a pinch roller of this age It's got a, a slick surface We're going to resurface that uh, It is important to look at it and see that it's uniform Which it is it's got a nice uniform shape there a little bit of a dome at the top. Uh, that's what you want. If it's slanted in either direction, it's defective. You got to find another one, which is getting increasingly harder these days, unless you have a boneyard. So what I do to resurface these is I will put them at an angle like this, and I will drag down at that angle, which forces. The pinch roller to rotate as I'm dragging it across the sandpaper. Let me put this on the mount and I'll just show you. Alright, so the next thing you have to do is using a small Phillips, you want to undo this screw right here, which is recessed. If you have the HX board, you can either take it off when you get the transport out or while the transport's still in. I'm just gonna do it while it's in. You squeeze two clips here, this one here, and this one here. And the HX board should just unplug from its socket like that. We'll just set that aside. And the other remaining screws are up top here. School is not in session. Either somebody's fire alarm is going off or somebody's being robbed down the street. I don't know if you guys can hear that bell ringing or not. Okay, so here comes the fun part. On the WR820, you need to push on the door as you get it out and away. It's going to take you a little bit of finagling to get it out. But there we go. The transport is now out and I can put this aside. So now there are three screws you can intend with. You've got one here in the middle of the circuit board. 
just to zoom in here so you can see it. And it's not uncommon for the plastic on this to strip out. This one's already half dead. It looks like the screw's going to come out, so we'll take this out. And then there are two more screws up top. There's one here for above the, each motor. And these ones require a little bit more pressure to get out. Turn it around so you can see what I'm taking out here. All right, so now that those are out, the transport separates into two halves. Tilt it back as you drop it away. Oh, I forgot one key step. You gotta unplug your detect switch if it has one. And you gotta unplug your head block. And just unroute the wiring here. So now away and down this comes apart into two halves. And somebody's already replaced the belts here, but these aren't very elastic. They're also a little thicker than I'd like. Uh, there was obviously some belt goo here. But anyway, uh, now that you've got this section out, give the motor a spin. We can see that it's got a little bit of noise. So we're going to take an oiler and we're going to apply oil to the bearing here, just a drop, and just kind of work that in there, quiet that down a little bit. Now here's your failure mode. Let me see if I can turn the light off here. No, that doesn't really help. Yeah, zoom in a little bit. See that big old crack? That cracked gear is your failure mode. If that gear cracks, a number of things are going to happen. Number one, most likely it will not initiate playback. If it's really busted, it won't initiate playback. If it's still kind of holding on, it'll start playback, but you'll notice that the reel tables will be jerky. It might even try to eat one of your tapes. Uh, classic early signs of failure is that when you go from play to stop, the supply wheel inside the cassette will turn counterclockwise a good turn and will unspool your cassette. So these have to go. And they come off really easy since they're cracked. They just, you know, you wiggle them a little bit and they pull off. <laughs> it's, that's it. It just it comes off. Let me turn the light back on here so we can better see it. But that's it. It's not going to focus, will it? Yeah, probably not. Well, anyway, they get a big old crack in them. Um, there is a gentleman, I believe he's in the Ukraine, who makes these new injection molded gears. He even sends them in a cool little soda bottle cap. Um, they're brand new. They're injection molded. They're not 3D printed. They are injection molded, and they're really high quality. He uh, has an eBay store. All of his pictures say the silicone mined, and they're really decent. Now, uh, I'm going to try to clean off that little bit of disgusting goo there. It's old belt goo. Somebody previously cleaned it off. We're going to finish that and just use some... Just some alcohol. Clean around this a little bit. You can go nuts and take the entire assembly apart and clean it, but I'm not going to do that because it doesn't need to, doesn't need to be done. We are going to finish cleaning whatever belt residue we can off of the pulley. I just have a Q-tip in here with alcohol. Clean all this off, and then we'll just push the new gear back on. It's going to be a tight fit because it's a fresh gear. Just go slow, make sure your gears mesh, and you want to push it so that the top of the motor 
just gets into the gear and the gears mesh about equal. Okay, so let's see here. Something about this is doesn't feel right. Maybe I'm pushing down on this too much. Maybe it's not enough. Mm, it's a little better. Yeah, that's better. Much better. That should have a nice loose feel to it, but still work. Okay, so that part's done, and we've got this motor oiled. I think I'm going to clean the pulley off a little bit better. Again, Q-tip and alcohol works great. Okay. Now, one thing you might run into on a very rare occasion, these detect switches up here get touchy. And sometimes uh, they need to be cleaned. There's still belt goo on there. Let's clean that off. Very rarely do these ever go bad, but if they do, there's two clips on the side here. Just pull them away very gently. The entire switch assembly separates. And you can see there are little nipples on the sides here. Apply very gentle pressure with like a jeweler's screwdriver underneath here. Pull the caps off. Oops. Pull the caps off and uh, using some emery paper like three or 4,000 grit, you can burnish the uh, switches. But it's very rare that these ever go bad. I have not maybe seen one of these go bad in 10 years. Maybe one deck in 10 years. They don't really die. But if they do, that's how to get it apart. So uh, now let's finish. Let's just do a quick sweep at the flywheel here. And if you're curious to see it cycle, push on that. Rotate it. That's play. And that should be stop. Yep, because the door opens there. But when it's stuck in a cycle, like if it's in play mode, like this, nope, that's also stopped. Maybe the latch is busted. Let's see, it's okay. So it's in play mode right now. You can see I can't open the door. Press on that, cycle it. Still in play. and now it opens. So that's why it doesn't open because while it's in play mode there's uh, a piece here that comes down to prevent the latch from opening. Okay, so now that we've done that part the next thing we need to do is clean the pinch rollers. Uh, there's little clips here at the bottom. I don't know if you can see that, but you pull back on this as you lift out and they just come off. And this is about typical for what you would see out of a pinch roller. It's a little bit slick Look at it against the backdrop and make sure that it's got a nice apex. It's not, you know, slanted or weirdly shaped. And usually the way that I deal with these is I'll just get a piece of sandpaper, 1,000 grit, and I'll put it at an angle like this, and I will drag, which forces the pinch roller to rotate as I drag. So I do that a couple times. And we can see if it'll focus, 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 focus. Not quite there yet. You want to keep doing it until the surface looks nice and matte finish. All right. Much better. Still has that nice apex there. Pay attention to if they get hard or little bubbles in them. When you put them back, you have to lift the head ever so slightly to get them in place and then let it fall. We're going to repeat with the other reverse pinch roller. This one's a little trickier to get at because of the door spring, but it does come off. This one wasn't used as much as the forward direction. It's still a little slick. So we'll just resurface that a little bit. And by doing it at an angle, 
it's rotating the wheel as you drag so that there's even resurfacing. You can see that that looks better. And again, lift up on the head to put it in place. Now that you've done that, take a look at your heads. These ends are a little dirty. Come on, get down in there. I know you can. Here we go. You can use a Q-tip and alcohol to clean the head and the uh, capstans. Make sure that you can freely rotate the head with very little effort. If it's sticky, you need to somehow get some penetrating lube up into that bearing behind the gear. That uh, very rarely gets sticky, but it does happen. All right, so we're good there. I've already cleaned that, but just to show you while you've got it apart, it's much easier while it's apart. And you can just get down in here and we can clean the head. You can clean the capstans as you rotate them. And I heard the thing trigger, so let's get it back to the neutral position again. There we go. All right. Now, the other thing, belts. What do you do about belts? On these ones, I use the uh, Russell Industries PRB EB Game FRW 8.5 for the main capstan belt. It's a .023 inch thick, so 23 thousandths thick. And then for the control belt, I use the SCX 2.6. Uh, call up Russell Industries in Pennsylvania. Uh, www.russellind.com, and that's Russell with two L's. And uh, I don't recall if you have to have a commercial account for them. I don't think so. But you can also look for EB Game or PRB distributors, and they can help you there. So to install the capstan belt, watch how I do this. This is not a reverse deck, so you need to go around the main flywheel, Which is a bit tricky here. You got to hold it in place and keep it from going underneath. And then you route it up around the reverse capstan flywheel. And they've conveniently provided three little pegs for you to put the belt around. Use them. Because the motor conveniently goes right in there. And as far as the intermediate belt, you push this fully counterclockwise to its stop, and then I will slide the belt underneath so that it grabs the pulley, and then I will place it up on this hook up here, like that. All right. Now, when you put this back together, you don't do it in reverse order. You just line it up, and once it's resting, you press on the bottom to latch the bottom. Leave the top loose. And then you can either use a hook tool or a pair of hemostats. I prefer the hemostat method. And we're going to grab onto this belt, and we're going to wrap it around the pulley here. And then we're going to simply slide the belt from the keepers onto the capstan motor. Rotate it a little bit to allow it to catch. Make sure it's not going to wander or come off. So that's that. Then we'll put our screws back in.
I always turn them counterclockwise to seat them until you hear the click and then tighten them down that'll prevent you from stripping it third one goes through here don't tighten this one just barely finger tights all you need otherwise you'll just break the plastic okie dokie And then we'll let's see. I think if that's how that went. We'll put the uh, HX Pro board back on. Just snaps in there. And then we'll fit it back into our front panel. and eject the door because you're going to need it to finagle it in there okay and then there's a little I don't know if you can see that lip there but that lip fits into that key might need to fight with it a little bit and you're going to want to hold it there while you put the two top screws back in. And we'll flip this up. And we'll mount the transport to the bottom one here. And then we'll route our cables. over like that and then our sensor switch okay so our transports are assembled and in our front panel That's a pretty mean scratch. All right. Not sure how that got there. Anyways, uh, what I'm going to do is put this back together. We're going to remount this to our front panel board. Getting this on here is a little bit of a chore. It's just lining everything up, making sure all the ribbon cables are out of the way. Okay. Don't mind me, I'm just going to bump the camera a bunch. And then what I'm going to do is put some screws back in it to hold it in place. See if I can get some. That looks a little better. 
And then, of course, we'll put the transport screws back in the bottom. And then we have to put the remaining screws that hold the front panel and stuff in. There's one here. And of course, this is going to be the one that fights me. We'll come back to that one. Yeah, this is going to be the one that fights me too. Probably doesn't hurt that I'm working with gravity. In fact, uh, let's see if we can do this without causing too much melee. There we go. Push that into its lock spot. Let's see if it'll go in now. There we go. And the final one is up top here. Okay. Oops. Now all we have left to do is to reconnect all of these. Okay, let's double check everything. Looks like we're good to go here. Okay. So next we'll fire it up, set our speed, and uh, check our head alignment. All right, so now that we got it back together, we do a quick test, and we see if the uh, head's engaged, and there's a sensor switch in the middle of the well that you push up on. That's your tape detection, and you press play. And you see it engages there, goes into reverse, got root fast forward, got rewind. That's good. Now, the other deck though, I discovered a terrible problem, and this is the sound that you do not want to hear. That's the sound of the cycling cam being jammed. And the reason why it's jammed has to do with the placement of the heads. Now, I'll take this apart shortly and I'll show you what I mean by that. But if we go down inside of the deck and we shine a light down in here, uh, this whole assembly here, the head block and the pinch rollers, are supposed to rest at a certain point and that point is called the neutral point or the stop point and uh, when the if the heads fall too far below the resting point due to death of plastic perches that stop the assembly from going any further down then the guide pin that interfaces with the cycling cam no longer interfaces at the right point and when the cycling cam goes to engage it jams so Unfortunately, this needs to get pulled out again, and we need to take a very close look 
at what the cycling cam and the head block is doing and see if we can put something in there to uh, make it behave itself. All right, so here's the transport with the back and the flywheels removed. And when I start the cycle by pressing on this, we can see that it goes a very short distance and then stops. You can't turn it past a certain point. And that's because it's jammed. Now if I push on the heads, if I lift up the heads a little bit, now it turns freely. Okay, everything's cool now. I push up on the heads. If I don't push up on the heads, take my hand away from the head block and trigger it, I can push past it a little bit, but it's hanging up there. Uh, so here's the cause. Now if we look at the head block, we see that way down here is this little opening. That little opening right there. Now let's see if I can zoom in on that. And see if we can hold the camera still, maybe. Anyway, uh, that, you can see from the side here, is that little piece of plastic. That's your stop. That's where the head comes down to rest. Now what happens is, is the little nub that used to hold it up this high is broken off. So now it sags down and it misses the pin. This is a problem that I've seen started to pop up in the last couple of years. Is it supposed to be up about this high, but it's down this high and then it jams. So in order to fix this, we have to find a way to restore the height of the stop point so that the heads don't jam the cycling cam when it goes to move. So that's going to be our challenge, and uh, that's not fun. But that's the only way that you're going to be able to fix this problem. Now what I've done in the past is, uh, is I have uh, I've taken a hot lead, like a metal lead, and I have literally melted a hole in that plastic behind there and pushed the lead through. And that creates the perch that's missing uh, for the stop point. So I think that's what we're going to end up doing with this one. And then when I get it uh, pushed through, you have to trim the lead off from the back side, otherwise it interferes with the reversing slide mechanism there. So you have very, very tight clearances, and you have to be very precise when doing this. Otherwise, uh, you just create a m bunch more headaches. But that's why it fails is because it's allowed to fall too far down. And if I push up on the head and cycle it, it's cool. It does its thing. And then when it falls back down to its position because that little perch isn't there, uh, it causes the heads to fall too far down and it jams. So it's not a lot of space. It's only about a millimeter and a half more space that you need. So that's why I usually just... Uh, heat up a lead with a soldering iron and push it through that plastic and that usually fixes it. So I'm going to see if I can position the camera in such a way that y'all can see that and um, hopefully that will restore this thing to operation and uh, we'll make it so that we can finish the rest of the project. Alright, let's see if I can make this happen. And let's see if I can get enough light on it that you can actually see what I'm doing. So what I do is I grab these leads. These leads that I cut off of components that I install, I save them. Because I find that they are useful in scenarios like this. And the way that you do it is, I'm going to grab it with some hemostats. And I'm going to place it in the area where I want the wedge and then what I do is I just heat the edge of that lead with a soldering iron and we just push and as the plastic melts it will sink in and then uh, I just trim off the excess and that's about the only way that you can do it these days let's see if I can prop it up well enough so that you can see it Maybe, maybe not. I uh, don't really have advantage here. 
So let's push this up and get our gap. And then I'm just going to apply downward pressure as I heat this with the soldering iron close to where it's entering. Don't touch that reversing gear there or you'll have a hell of a time later. Just heat it up. And it's starting to go through. There we go. So it's gone through the plastic backing behind that. And we can see, like I said, if you don't trim that, it will bump into the uh, auto reverse slide and it won't reverse. So we get some diagonal cutters here and very carefully trim this off. Without creating too much of a problem for that. And as we can see, even a little bit of it post stuck into the auto reverse thing. Get that clear. And let's make sure that moves freely. Yes it does. And then now we've got that little bit of metal up there as our ledge. And it's sticking to the plastic. Uh, that was there and it's thin flimsy plastic oops gotta stop bumping that I'm just gonna make sure that I can't pull it out really easy so far so good Trim off the excess here so there isn't a big force lever to whale on it. And we got that little bit sticking out there. So that's, you can see the lead sticking out, that creates our space. Now what you may want to do, if you're really handy with it, I mix up some five minute epoxy and I get down in here with a dental pick and very carefully apply it you are going to want to scar the little plastic ledge here I'm just going to get an exacto knife and scar it up a little I put the uh, five minute epoxy between the two to hold it there as kind of reinforcement and you can stick an object here to jam it uh, so that this doesn't come down while you're waiting for the epoxy to dry. In fact, a little tiny screwdriver is probably adequate. So, prop this up a little bit more and uh, let me go get the epoxy. And this is just the uh, plain old fashioned Bob Smith Industries five minute quick cure. We don't need very much, so we're not going to mix very much. Okay. We'll just take a Q-tip and mix these two together. Mix it real good, and then we'll use a little dental pick to apply it. And all that's doing is just preventing wiggle and jiggle and things from coming apart later. This is a problem that's going to be the death of all of these, unless you put these little spacers in. Okay, you want to mix it to where it starts to thicken up a little bit so that you're not uh, putting a watery epoxy down to that spot because you don't want it to get on anything else. It's just to hold that little pin in place. And so, let me get this little pick that I've made here. Put the tiniest little bit on here. 
lift up slightly. Just put it all around that. Use the other side. Scrape off some junk I was using the other side for. And just very carefully go down in here. don't want the epoxy to get on the walls of the transport because if it interrupts that movement of the head bracket there I may have to push this pin in a little bit more because it's going to bump into the bottom side let's just do that while things are drying Right. Ugh. This is just such a pain in the ass repair, but it's the only way to make it work. Everything's just coming in at once today. Okay, and just pushing a little bit more. If it sticks too far out, then it will keep the heads from fully coming up. All right. Push down on that a little bit. It's just the super fine line between functioning and not functioning. And let's go check clearances again here. Nope. Phone is just blowing up today. Push down again. All right, that clears it. Now I have to remove the excess epoxy that got in here. You gotta love it. I'm taking the pick and I'm cleaning out the excess epoxy that's dribbled down in here. Can't have that floating around. All right. It looks like we're going to work. What a pain. Okay. Let me clear out some junk from there. I see a little webby thing in there that I need to clear out. You have to make sure all traces of this epoxy are gone because if they aren't, Things will stick that shouldn't stick. Okay, no webs as I push up here. I'm looking down into this hole to see if a web shows up when I push up, which tells me that there's still epoxy stuck to it, but there's not anymore. Dang it. The thing about having this here is that it's like right in my way. Okay. And let's see here. We do have clearance issues with the auto reverse slide again. So I need to go clippy clippy like that. 
and then check that this reverses it does and then go back and see that I haven't disturbed the position of that which I haven't okay I think this safe this thing is safe to reassemble so let's put our uh, flywheels back in come on yeah I'm gonna be bumping the camera so can't really help that it's all everything's kind of in the way here but I certainly couldn't do this with one hand. Here's our other flywheel retainer. Okay. Let's check one more time that uh, if I engage this it does not jam. It does not jam. Excellent. Door opens, no impediment there. Great. So this really means that I can in fact put it back together. The reason why I keep bumping the camera is because it sits particularly low right now so that you could see me doing the repair on the uh, perch. And I do have to reset its position. But I'll do that after I put this all back together. Right now I'm just concerned with it going back together. This has certainly been a challenging one, but like I said, now more so than five years ago, those little plastic perches that keep the heads from falling down too low are all breaking apart. And I'm sure I'm going to see that a whole hell of a lot more. Alright, let's get our little fancy hook tool. here. These transports really require a level of dexterity that means that you have to be on your A-game. Okay, that looks good. Let's reroute our head wires. And then put our Dolby board back in. All right, back in the machine it goes. All right, so a moment of truth. Does it cycle? Ah, forgot to put the capstan belt back on. That should be easy enough to do from this vantage. OK, 
okie dokie. Let's try that again. There we go. Reverses. Excellent. Fast winds. Bingo. Alright. So the major transport work's done. We can do the alignment and setups. However, one thing I discovered when I was putting this back in that troubled me was this. And you're going, what is that? That's a lot of corrosion coming out of there. And that is directly above where the power supply caps sit down in here. That's another problem that goes wrong is these leak. So this board's going to need to come up and we need to examine what's going on there. We need to talk to the owner of this thing about that. Because uh, if I do the transport service and six months later the board fails because the electrolyte's eaten through everything, that's a problem. So uh, this nightmare deck it's just got more nightmares so we have to take the back cover off and we have to pull that board up and we have to see what's going on with the power supply because I'm betting that one or more of these probably this guy here uh, the Kemet is probably with one pissing I don't see staining on the top side of the board but the uh, corrosion thing bothers me so we got to look into that well let's get this over with and see if I'm really dealing with what I think I'm dealing with because there's no point in sending this thing back if the uh, motherboard's saturated in capacitor P and it'll last a couple months and then all the foil traces will die so the best way to approach this is to get the back off these two screws here hold the regulator heat sinks on. This set has just had a plethora of things wrong with it. I thought it was just going to be, hey, let's service the transport, like always. But uh, a lot of surprises on this deck. Let's see here. I tilt this up this off and I can already see it you can probably see it too down there not what I want to see so I'm going to take these screws loose and take up the board and let's see what else here there's another screw here Last week I think I worked on a W7 ESA, which uh, is a more evolved version of this. What's still holding this board in here? Got to be something. Let's take this loose so I can see a little bit better here. There's got to be one of those plastic retainer clips. I think I see one of them. This one's loose, so I'm thinking that's the capacitor that peed. Oh yeah, look at that. That bit of crusty beauty right there. Let's see, the other one's at the corner here, behind this capacitor. Yep, there it is. That's where it's hiding. And pull this up. And of course, the other one snaps back down. All right. Someone already made repairs to this. All right. So that's good. I don't have to mess with that too much. Uh, let's see here. Let me just take a quick look at this. Let me zoom in a little bit. Yeah, so someone's already dealt with this. 
This happened a while back. You can definitely see the evidence of repairs. Somebody made a jumper. They cleaned this up for the most part. Resoldered this regulator. So uh, I really don't have to mess around with that. Although uh, I do see, that's probably not possible to see from this vantage, but this guy here, um, come on, hold still. I hate trying to focus this thing at a distance. It just will not focus at a distance. Uh, these joints here are breaking loose for the audio. So let's just go ahead and take care of those. Because that's a just about every 80s and 90s piece of Sony gear I see as audio jacks that have come loose. So we'll take care of that. right okay so that's kind of a sigh of relief but as you can see there's definitely capacitor P that occurred at some point that screwed up the board really bad so you might want to pull yours up and check it because I'm sure let's see if I can get this back lined up again Come on now, there's one, there's two, that's good, that's one more thing I don't have to do on this set. on here and I have to finagle with the uh, heat sinks on the devices here. I'll just slide those over. Make it easier on me later. Well, now that that's out of the way, I can uh, do the test. We'll check the wow and flutter. We'll check the speed. We'll check the head alignment. And hopefully it won't need much else. Now the pinch rollers on these decks get hard and crusty. And although I've resurfaced them, that doesn't always mean a magic fix. And the owner of this deck has already notified me that he's more concerned with it working than super high fidelity. So we're just going to try to make it so that it plays and it plays decently. I'm not going to strive for perfection here because without a new set of pinch rollers it's not really possible to do that. But we'll see what we can accomplish. Like I said, this, uh, this deck has just been a nightmare of things wrong with it. But this was the first generation of the TCM 190. Uh, the later generations are a lot easier to service, mainly because they don't have the extra boards on the back. All right, so let's replug in that cable there. Make sure everything's cool here. And we'll plug in some audio cables to my uh, Wow and Flutter meter. See if we can't get this thing going. One thing I did notice is that this deck here, this side, has a little bit of contamination on the capstan. Almost looks like metal that's beginning to corrode, so that will definitely affect our wow and flutter performance. All right. I'm trying to figure out how I can position this thing so that you can see the wow and flutter meter in the back there. That's all that's okay. All right. 
Um, first, let's check for speed. Zero that out. Let me go get my test tape. Okay, so first we're just going to do the speed and the wow and flutter test. So let's look at the uh, left deck here. And we're going to do the forward direction first. I said forward direction. There we go. As you can see up there, the speed's pretty spot on. So I don't have to tweak that. Uh, let's see what our wow and flutter looks like. kind of all over. This is weighted. Let's just go to standard measurement. And on a scale of 1%, we're at about, let's see, yeah, about half a percent. So that's not acceptable at all. If we go back down here on the 0.3%, we're at 0.225. That's yucky. So uh, let's see what it looks like in reverse. Let's see. I'm not getting much out of the reverse side of things. I'm not getting any sound out of the reverse side of things. Interesting. Well, I'm getting very low output. Very low. Not enough for that really that meter to register. So that could be a head alignment thing, which we'll check, or that could be the head's just plain old worn out. Uh, let's try the right deck and see what the right deck looks like. And that's not happy. Let's see here. We go to our speed measurement. Wow, look at that. Speed up and down and up and down and up and down. And I bet you that's uh, starting to smooth out. That's per rotation of the pinch roller, so that's not good. That could mean we have a slick spot. That could mean and it's the same in the other direction, too. How weird. That's our speed. Up and down and up and down. That's per rotation. This deck is behaving very strangely. So let's take a look inside of the uh, tape well here. All right, so I'm going to try to engage play and see if I can take a look at what the uh, pinch rollers are doing. Bear with me a second. Look at that. Look at how out, out, out around that pinch roller is. Holy crap. That's terrible. I don't think I've ever seen one that bad. That's really bad. And it was the same on the other side too, as I recall. Let's go back to that side. Oh yeah, just as crummy. Oh, bad pinch rollers. That's no good. Oh, let me see if I got some in a in my uh, collection of pinch rollers. All right, so here are some poles. I can get the bag open. These are poles that I've gotten off of various decks that got scrapped out. They look okay, but are they going to work? That's the, always the question. And then these are uh, these are for different sides, so I got to find one for both the left and both the right. This is not fun. Looks like this one is a right side pinch roller. And then, let's see, I've got another right side pinch roller, and then I've got a left side pinch roller, and another left side pinch roller. Uh, let's see if I can...
find any notable defects like this one here that one's got a divot in it so that one's a no-go that one looks pretty good so we'll stick with that one uh, let's look at this back here The surface on that isn't gray. I'll see if I can resurface it up. Oh, that's got a divot in it. That might come out. And then we got this one here. It's also got a divot in it. Man. So, not a great selection of parts to choose from. But this is all I've got left in inventory. The parts for these things are drying up, so I don't really have a, a, a choice. I'm sure I could make some other pinch roller work if I wanted to, but given what the requirements of this uh, customer are, that's probably far beyond what I'm willing to expend as far as time. So let me resurface these things and see if they turn out a little better. Okay. So I'm going to hope that these ones turn out a little bit nicer that should be usable I'm doing it at an angle so they rotate as I turn and that one's still got an ugly spot on it yeah I'm not sure if I want to use that one let's try this That ain't great either, but there's no divots or spots that I can see. Give it a, maybe a little bit better texture. All right, so we got one left and one right. Got to pop that transport out again. And uh, swap the pinch rollers out. <laughs> this thing's just a barrel of fun. All right, here we are. And clips are down here. I'm going to pop this one out. Set that aside. And put our new one in. Don't tell me this is a different hub than the other one. Yep, I think it is. I think it's a different hub because this one doesn't want to fit. Let's compare. different hub and this one doesn't have the spring on it all right so we got to pop this one out get the old pinch roller out and put the better one in we'll use the uh, axle off there all right so that'll go back in this one out and since we already know that this is going to be a different hub pop this one out and put this in okay All right, let's get the transport back in and check it again. Okie dokie, we're back in again. Let's see if we can get a snapshot of the uh, wow and flutter meter here. And let's hope that those pinch rollers will solve our issue. low output condition or something because this just isn't picking it up uh, let's see here those are your speed that should be your level control there because this is supposed to be 10 dB below the reference level and it is falling a little short 
See if I can reach back here and adjust the playback levels a little bit. Yeah, let's come up here and do this one. It's just like not registering for some reason. Uh, let's see what the scope says. Let me just attach this here real quick. Come on now. I can't quite get to this. No, it's definitely a transport problem. Definitely a transport problem. I'm trying to clip on here so we can see. Uh, let me just pop this out here real quick. Anyway, this is what we're looking at. It's like the tape's wandering all over. Yuck. So, that's not acceptable either. Let's... Uh, Reverse. That's not good. See, now this one registers. And we've got... Well, it's running a little fast, but stable at least. If I can find what I did with my little adjustment screwdriver, we can turn the speed down a little bit. Let me uh, tweak the speed pot here. Don't mind me. Speed pot's down in here somewhere. There we go. So speed's there. While in flutter is about 0.15 if we want to average it out. Yeah, about 0 0.14 or 0.15. So the reverse direction's happy. Uh, let's check and see if our uh, new roller is dirty. I'll clean that roller real quick and then we'll see if that changes anything. Alright, I cleaned the roller and the capstan on that take up side. Yeah, it's still going nuts. Still going nuts. You can see that huge difference in the speed there. And if I mess with the pinch roller, if I apply more pressure, let's see if I apply more pressure, doesn't really help anything. Uh, all right, let's take a look on the oscilloscope and see if it's a tape path alignment problem. Although, let me go get the tape path alignment uh, tape and see if it's wandering. Alright, so this is more or less a job for the mirror cassette, and uh, what the mirror cassette does is exactly what it implies, is it has a 45 degree, excuse me, let me move this out of the way, a 45 degree angle mirror inside that allows me to take a look at the tape as it passes over the heads, uh, although we may have some difficulty with this because the door's in the way on this one, they do have a window, but I don't know how well that's going to work for me. But basically what I want to try to see is if we have a uh, tape path alignment problem in the forward direction. So there's our little window. And I'm going to see if turning the light off and refocusing things, eh, not so much. Let's leave the light on. You like Tom Bodette, 
And we have massive overexposure, that's great. Let's see here. What I'm looking for is uh, See, the tape's not wandering, it's staying in a linear path. Oh, there we go. You can see it way back in there. I can hold the damn camera still. You can see the tape flutter over the uh, pinch roller there. So that pinch roller's still no good. It looked okay, but it's not. I mean, it's better, but it's still still not great. But see how the tape's fluttering there? And as it's being pulled over the head, that's messing with things. Um, so yeah, that's why you got to have these tools. So... I'm thinking there's still something wrong with that pinch roller. Obviously, it's got a defect in it somewhere. Gotta come out. Although I may be able to pop that out and replace it without taking the whole transport out again. Alright, so that pinch roller's out. My last good one's in. Let's first check it with this and uh, see what I'm looking at here and the perch is broken I love it oh man this thing has just become an utter nightmare the plastic part that I uh, welded the perch to has obviously failed so that sucks alright so giving it a little assist I'm just going to take a peek in here. Let's see if this helps any. Well, it's looking a little better. Let's see what uh, Mr. Wow and Flutter Meter says. <sighs> You're going to be the death of me. Flutter meter still looks crummy, and it's still just not registering right. So I'm not sure what to think at this point. The mirror cassette says it's happy, but it obviously is not. And if we look in here, pinch roller is uh, round. It's not bobbling. Man, oh man. Same with this one, but uh, that reverse direction, reverse direction looks good. I just, uh, I wonder if somebody's been messing with the uh, tape path alignment, or maybe one of the guides is broken and I'm just not paying attention. No, guides are still there, so that's, uh, that's not it. Uh, all right, let's uh, hook this up to the scope. Yeah, let's take a look, see what this thing's doing. It's driving me batty. Hang on a second. All right, so when we hit play, here's what we're looking at. This is better than before, but you can still see that we have a uh, pinch roller eccentricity of course, this was the one that had the little dot on it, I think. So that one's just, uh, yeah, wasn't as good as I would have liked it to be. So this is the fault of a bad pinch roller, really. There's not a whole lot I can do with that. But you can see every rotation, also the head alignment is off. Look at the phase shift on that. 
That's bad. I wonder if somebody's been tweaking the alignment screws on this thing. So if we come over here, let's uh, at least get some phase coherence in here. Yeah, it's better. Much better. You can get it closer. Yeah, that's pretty good. A little bit of drift there. That was bad. But you can see the channel's speed moving back and forth and all that. That's just bad tape tracking, bad pinch roller. And without a fresh set of pinch rollers, there's not a whole lot I can do. Now if we go to reverse, the reverse is out of alignment too. I wonder if somebody just got crazy with the head alignment screws here. Correct the phase. And let's look at our uh, left deck in comparison. The longer I work with this thing, the more problems just sh keep showing up. Like I press forward and it goes into reverse. Alright, well anyways, so you get that going again. We can see the output on this deck is much less. And uh, someone has been screwing with the head alignment on this one too. Everybody just reaches for the, the alignment tools. Speed's wrong, let's align the heads. Yeah, let's see if I can boost the output on this thing a little bit. This is bad. That's all you're going to get out of it. Yeah, these heads are just trash. This one had a big wear gap in it. I mean, it's okay. Now that I've got a better output on it, let's see if it'll register on the wow and flutter meter again. Yeah, wow and flutter is pushing 0.2%. It's just, it's not what it used to be. And now I'm having transport issues with this one. And in the reverse direction, it's not even registering. And look at that. Yucky. It's not eating the tape, but it certainly isn't uh, behaving. Take a look at it with the mirror cassette. Uh, yeah, we got some wander there. That pinch roller is defective. Let's wind past that. <laughs> it's not wanting to release either. Oh. Yeah, it didn't chew it too bad. All right. So let's see what's going on in this one. That one could be slick. It could be oily. Uh, let's see what happens when you throw it in play mode. See, that's the caption that's got the junk on it. Uh, that could be doing it for sure. Yeah. This thing is just not in good shape. And hear the crap on there.
Why am I doing this? Because I'm trying to scrape off whatever crusties are on here. There's certainly a lot of them. That's rust. That's like actual corrosion. If I'd have known it was that bad, I would have tried to find a capstan flywheel. Yeah, let me see if I can resurface that. That's terrible. Or which way you play it, uh, that pinch roller down in there is defective. I've tried cleaning the capstan and resurfacing it. I've tried cleaning and resurfacing this. This roller is not round anymore. It's just, it's defective. Uh, so, I don't have any more spares. This one's just going to have to be a forward direction deck. And it's just marginal fidelity at this point. And then we have issues here. I pushed the little guide pin uh, back out so the perch was there. And so this plays. It's just not great wow and flutter. And likewise, when we go backwards, it plays. It's correct phase alignment, but it's just not great. And if we come over here and hook up to our wow and flutter meter, we just see that it's bobbling around 0.15. And that's forward direction forward direction is worse than the reverse direction. Reverse direction is pretty good. But this is just, ugh. Without a new set of pinch rollers, it ain't going to happen. So I got to talk to the guy and see if he's willing to accept that because uh, I'm out of parts. And uh, yeah, so this is, I'm going to pop this uh, left pinch roller out and use one of the other ones I pulled real quick and see if that makes a difference. Alright, so I swapped the pinch roller with one of the crummier ones that I have. But, um, let's see here. Yeah, as we can see, our wild and flutter is still off the charts. It's uh, still about half a percent. And the speed's all over. This is one of the worst ones that I have, but it's one of the only ones left. It just pegs it at 0.3, just not good. And then if we uh, take a look at it on the scope again, we can see that we definitely have some tape path alignment problems. And that left channel just keeps wanting to drop. It's just, ugh. Terrible condition. Forward direction's more stable. And then it just comes off the head. And the tensioning on it's wrong. If I pull the tension back up, it corrects itself for a little bit. But yeah. So. And I like how it just uh, kind of has a mind of its own lately, so something else is going on. Anyway, this is uh, this deck just has so much wrong with it. And as much as I'd like to fix it, I've only gotten it to marginal playback, and I've probably blown about four hours on it. I've exhausted my spare inventory of pulled parts, which, as you can see, are not very good. Uh, I think this is just going to end up being a single-direction... Uh, deck. The forward direction here is definitely better than the reverse. The reverse direction here is better than the forward. Uh, then there was the problem with the plastics crumbling on the perch that caused the misalignment here. So it's just all sorts of stuff wrong with this. So this is not really a good candidate. And I've tried my best on this one, but, but without wasting my entire life, I don't think that this is going to be a deck that will be worth pursuing. And as much as I hate to say that, uh, this has just got so much wrong with it. And it's had a previous service history. It's had a messy life. So you can't fix them all. Uh, I made it a playable machine. 
let's just hear a quick snippet of how it sounds through the stereo. Alright, so here's some Eagles. Left deck, playback. Alright, reverse. Yeah, kind of junky. Uh, let's try the right deck. That's pretty bad. That sounds okay. Uh, reverse sounds okay, and then it can't always figure out what it wants to do there. So, anyway, like I said, uh, for this deck, this is as good as it's getting. It's got so much wrong with it, and I just don't think that I can make it any better without sourcing all new pinch rollers and figuring out whatever else is wrong with the logic that keeps the transports from acting perfect all the time. So, anyways, I hope you'd enjoyed this uh, crazy debacle of a machine. It's definitely not going to be perfect, but it does play. So, thanks for watching the video. More stuff to come.